Welcome to the Mitchell Center for Sustainability Solutions in our Sustainability Talk series. My name is David Hart, and I'm the director of the Mitchell Center. After what happened last week in Lewiston, I couldn't imagine giving my normal introduction to today's talk. Even though I was far away from the horrific violence that unfolded last Wednesday, my sense of the world shattered before my eyes. So I'll never be able to imagine how people who lost loved ones must feel. There must be so many wounds. Will they ever heal? And if you're anything like me, you may be trying to find hope at a time that feels so bleak. I certainly didn't know where I could find it. So I was very grateful when some hope found me earlier today. At noon, I attended a special gathering at the student union just a few hundred yards from here to celebrate the launch of something called the Black Bear Community Fridge. The project is led by Kate Flynn, an undergraduate majoring in political science and her mentor, Suzanne Lee, who is a faculty fellow in the Mitchell Center, and a lot of partners, great partners. The Community Fridge is an actual fridge where food will be available nearly 24 hours a day at no cost for those who need it. And given the widespread occurrence of food insecurity in and beyond Maine, this fridge can serve as a valuable source of sustenance for anyone. But it has other benefits. By keeping food out of landfills, it's re reducing methane emissions, which are important drivers of climate change. And the sign on the top of the fridge says something important too, feeding people, not landfills. And because food is so central to everything in our lives, the community fridge serves as a simple act of kindness in a world in which kindness is sometimes in short supply. It's also a hopeful example of the type of collaboration that is needed so badly right here and right now. People, especially young people, working together to address difficult challenges in our own backyard and across the planet. Now it's only one small step but I believe it will help us take much bigger steps towards the creation of a better world. And speaking of food and food systems, it's a pleasure to welcome today's speaker, Ernesto Mendez. Ernesto is an internationally recognized agroecology scholar. His work, as you'll hear, is based in participatory action research, an approach that emphasizes working with communities to take action, to conduct action-oriented research that benefits those communities over time. Trained in agronomy, Ernesto's career has focused on using innovative approaches to address problems faced by farmers and farming communities. He uses a food systems perspective to understand the complexity of social, environmental, political issues. He's the faculty director of the Institute for Agroecology at the University of Vermont. He's also the former advisor of our own Rachel Shatman. The goals of his IFA program are to use research, learning, and action to transform food systems, regenerate the environment, cool the planet, and provide healthy food for all, including, including the kind of food that we hope will be in the community fridge. 
So please join me in welcoming Ernesto Mendez to the Mitchell Center. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. And thank you for David and Rachel for the invitation. As David mentioned, it is a pleasure for me to be here and be able to see Ra Rachel thriving with her students. I'm also really happy that Yannick Anderson is here. She also did her PhD with us. And I am going to talk about work that she did in, um, in Southern Mexico as part of her dissertation. I also share the deep sadness that you express, David, for what happened here in Maine and what is happening, it seems like, in many parts of the world right now. So I have been doing agroecology for a really long time, almost 30 years. And like David mentioned, I started as an agronomist and very interested in the ecology of agriculture. So I was very much a biophysical scientist. I still am, although these days I do more administration than research or anything else. But when we, we launched the Institute for Agroecology at the University of Vermont this year, it was probably a 12 year project and process. So it's a big deal for us. And we really wanted to intentionally focus on an agroecology that has a transformative perspective um, with an aspiration to really support, contribute to processes processes that support um, attaining ecologically sound and socially just food systems. This means understanding the complexities that we are now facing in our food systems, and then also bringing knowledge to bear and research and learning and outreach as part of those processes. And you can see that the level of complexity that is presented up in this slide is pretty high and it can be daunting, but it is, that is what re reality is. So I feel that we really need to embrace complexity rather than shy away from it. At the end of the day, this transformation that we aspire to, um, over here you, you can see this diagram by the um, International Panel of Experts in Sustainable Food Systems, IPES Food, and it is mostly about farming systems, but that is what we would want to see for the entire food system. It's really important to see where we, st we are starting from. I work a lot with smallholder farmers in developing countries, I'm originally from Latin America, from El Salvador. And there's also industrialized farmers in the US. There's a lot of people with large farms that are farming um, very intensively. And our aspiration is that we are going to bring all types of farmers into a more sustainable, not just agricultural, but also food system. Agroecology as a guide uses principles. And I just wanted to show you briefly, I'm not gonna discuss them in detail, but these are 13 principles of agroecology that the high level panel of experts from the United Nations came up with in a report they published in 2019. There are 13 of them. When we work with our partners that can be nonprofits or farmer organizations, sometimes individual farmers, we don't ask them to just like embrace all 13. We usually start little by little with the things that are most important to them. And, uh, but it is good to look at these and notice that there are both ecological principles and biophysical principles and also social principles and pr principles um, related to equity and participation. So my career over these last 25 years in agroecology has really come to bear. This is, um, I would say, one of my biggest achievement is to be able to present this new institute in a land-grant university, which might be the first institute for agroecology 
at a land grant. And I didn't realize how important this was until Rachel and I and Yannicka were in a meeting last May in Kansas City, Missouri, where we brought together about 100 people from all over the country to discuss agroecology. And everyone was saying that. It's so amazing that this institute's happening in a land grant university. I did my doctorate degree at University of California, Santa Cruz. And we do have a center for agroecology there. But it is not the California land grant. UC Davis. So it is a big deal. We're really proud of it. And the reason I wanted to mention it in this talk is because I do think if we want to transform our food systems, we need to also think about institutionalizing these approaches, which is not an easy thing. But I believe one year in that it's worth it. I'll come back five years from now and see what I see. <laughs> And when we do this, it is important to center the aspirations that we are hoping to work on. And these are the three guiding pillars of the IFA, um, as we call it. The first one, which is, I like to say it's deep transformation, and it's about engaging with and not ignoring those structural issues that really affect our agricultural and food systems. So as an agronomist that really wanted to just be mostly in the field studying practices, I learned that I also needed to take into account what policies are helping farmers or not helping farmers. And even though it's a little overwhelming, at least have an awareness and a certain engagement. So for you that are doing masters or PhDs, that doesn't mean that if you are working on soil health, you're going to have to become a political scientist. But it does mean that it will serve us all if you understand well what are some of those structural forces that are affecting the farmers that you work with or the crop or system that you're working with. The second pillar is the kind of research that we do. And again, participatory research, participatory action research, I like to say is about doing research with people or people. So getting our partners involved in as many aspects of the research as possible so that at the end of that process or at the end of one iteration, those partners are really satisfied with the work and they feel that the work has been done for them and not just for me to publish a scientific paper. Transdisciplinarity, and I'm gonna talk about it a little bit more, is about embracing, valuing, different types of knowledge. So we are all getting trained and I've been trained in a Western scientific type of knowledge. And the first thing that I wanna do is acknowledge that there are other knowledges, indigenous knowledge, the practical local knowledge that farmers have that they develop that is not necessarily coming out of books. That knowledge to me is a treasure, a richness that we need to use more in our work. And the final one is about centering equity. And we are really committed to bringing this perspective to everything we do. And I was meeting with Rachel's lab today, and we were discussing even if your work is to compare different seed varieties of a specific crop, you can always ask questions related to equity if you are committed to it. You can ask who is using these seeds, what kinds of farmers, and if they're not participating or using them, why not? How hard is it for farmers to use the seeds that I'm doing? Maybe you don't get to do anything about it, but you're engaging, you're bringing awareness to the issue of equity. So that's the way we wanna engage with everything that we do. When we talk about transdisciplinarity um, in agroecology, there's been some work that proposes that you can find this field expressed in the science, like the institute's a good example of that, uh, in a university, academic, scientific, in practice of farmers applying it, in policies, and this is something that 15 years ago, maybe I couldn't give you some examples, but now there are actually laws and policies focusing on <laughs> advancing agroecology at the country level, at the state level. 
Um, I think there is a food sovereignty law here, right? So those are examples. It doesn't mean that they're getting enforced, but at least people in the policy world are engaging with them. There's also a lot of agroecology and social movements. La Via Campesina, who's the biggest peasant organization around the world, has seen in agroecology the type of approach that they want their farmers to use and the kind of approach that they want support for. These are smallholder farmers, peasant farmers from around the world, although there are chapters of La Via Campesina here in the United States and also in Europe. Where we go with this work and what where I'm really interested personally in is that, let's see, I'm gonna follow directions here. It's this little red dot in the middle because it's really easy for me to say that scientists and social movement people are going to sit down and talk about how to advance agroecology. That's really hard to do and for it to happen. So we really need to be intentional and conscious about how do we get people that speak different languages to come together and advance this agenda? Um, we have to listen. We have to speak kindly. We have to be committed to the dialogue, right? So that is a lot of us at the Institute for Agroecology are working in that middle point of dialogue across these different actors and dimensions. It's not easy work, but if you get three of these different sectors to work together, you can actually do a lot. So I'm gonna shift because I wanted to give you a, an example of our work um, on participatory action research. This diagram is a little busy, we could say. It is probably the fourth diagram that we've come up with in our group. And again, doing research with people for people. So I'll just go over the diagram. This preflection um, stage when you do participatory action research is what my 17-year-old would call talking to a girl, right? You're not dating, you're not, but you're interested and you're starting to talk. So researchers and farmers and organizations are starting to talk. You haven't committed to doing anything. You're getting to know each other. If you decide to move to the next phase of dating, so everybody hears about it, right? My son Adrian and ex person are dating now. You can decide to start working together. And um, participatory action research is something that is done in a lot of different fields. You can find it in public health, education, um, geography general social sciences, and people will propose it in different ways. This is the way that we propose it, so I just want to be humble about it, that this is our way, it's not the only way. But we usually look at three things that happen in this process. One is research, the other one is reflection, and the last one is action. We used to have these neat um, cycles of that started with research, then went to reflection and then action. And we honestly realized that is not the way it happens. It's a lot messier. Sometimes your partners want action right away. And if you're committed to the process, maybe that's what you do. And then you come back to the research. What we have learned though, is that the reflection piece is incredibly important. It doesn't matter what you did before, coming together and reflecting about what worked, what didn't work, and where you want to go next is really important. So those black circles are the ones where the collective is making a decision if the next step is more research, more reflection, or a specific action. And our commitment in the Institute is that all of the research that we do now, we try for it to be participatory action research. It wasn't the case before. And the last thing I'll say before the example is that a lot of this work is not easy. As if you start reading the literature in agroecology related to transition and transformation, you will see that there is a call 
for agroecologists to be somewhat radical in their approach, we could say, in order to disrupt food systems that are not working. And this is not easy because of we all have personal histories and background. They said I was born and raised in El Salvador in a very patriarchal place. So for me, it's not that easy to sometimes to engage in gender dynamics. I need to do a little bit of work on my own. Some self-reflection about how best am I going to show up when I, when I want to treat women in a different way. And it doesn't mean that I'm intentionally doing it, but I might carry that. So it just takes this personal work for collective action. It requires a lot of humility and a lot of commitment. But I've committed that I'm always going to talk about this in all my talks, because as I go around in my work, which is very international as well as national, I see a lot of people just sort of like nodding their heads when some of this is discussed. But I can't tell if there is a, a real commitment to engage in this as an individual. And one important thing is to think it's not about individually doing things. It's about an individual contributing to a collective and being supported by a collective. So this work, um, and you can see here that Yannicka is credited for the picture, um, is a project process that we undertook around 2016 to start working with two coffee smallholder cooperatives in Chiapas, Mexico, and Esteli, Nicaragua. I'm going to talk about the Mexico case study because that's the one the University of Vermont focus more on. And you can see here a picture of a coffee farm with a lot of different components. And I'm really proud of this project. A lot of us worked on it because we were very intentional about this participatory action research process. You can see here our partners. We had a coffee cooperative in each of the countries as well as a university in each of the countries. We had a nonprofit based in California, CAN. Santa Clara University was the one leading the Nicaragua process because they've been working there for a while. And the University of Vermont working in Mexico. This was funded by three European foundations that developed an, an, an initiative called the Thought for Food Initiative. So the objective was to engage with one of the agroecology principles that I presented earlier, which is diversity. Coffee farmers, and I was sharing with Rachel's group today that as an agronomist, we usually pick a crop that we work in coffee is my crop. I've been working in coffee for at least 20 years uh, with smallholder coffee cooperatives. And in coffee, there's always this obsession with diversification because whenever the prices go down really low and those prices are set internationally in the New York Stock Exchange and farmers struggle, everybody reacts by saying, you need to diversify. And I've been hearing this forever, right? So we had a research question of saying, okay, so everybody says diversify, but nobody has really analyzed how different diversification strategies play out, if they really worked, if the farmers did better or what. So that was the researcher idea. Then we spent about six months <coughs> negotiating with the cooperatives about what they wanted to do. And they were interested in diversification too, um, but maybe not as much in some of the food security issues. Climate change was an interest and gender equity, perhaps not as much. But I always say that participatory action research is a negotiated process. So we were able to move forward with that general research objective. The cooperative that we work with is the Campesinos Ecologicos de la Sierra Madre de Chiapas, or SESMACH. They, the, their numbers have dwindled, actually. It's probably less than 663 members now. Um, 
but you can see a little bit of the landscape, the processing plant, the beekeeping group, a family, and um, yeah, and a beautiful coffee landscape there. There were a lot of people involved. If you remember, we had a university partner, we had a nonprofit partner, and we had a cooperative partner. So these are pictures of some of our partners. This is a photo at Ecosur, um, which was our university partner with mostly faculty and students. This is a photo at the cooperative. Uh, I think maybe that's Yannicka over here. Yes. And here it's a mixed photo in one of the workshops, many workshops that we did. This is the, I guess we could go, what were they calling themselves? The facilitation group, and Danica's there too. We had the luck of um, being able to hire Rigoberto, which is right in the middle, right over here, as the coordinator of the project. And one of the things that we do in participatory action research at the Institute is try to recruit youth to be a part of the process. So you can see all of people except for Yannicka and a couple of others are either coffee farmers themselves or sons or daughters of coffee farmers. And they became the primary research and facilitation team um, led by Rigoberto, who was in the middle. Their um, motto was that not everyone knows everything, everybody knows something. And you can see here, we even had a little logo there, diversification in coffee plantations of Mesoamerica, participatory action research in Mexico and Nicaragua. So all of this is really part of the process and a very important part of creating teams from the local partners um, focused on facilitation, Better yet, if they're younger people from the communities that might gain some skills and stay there whenever we leave. The other big focus on participatory action research is the co-creation of knowledge and knowledge exchange. So as part of, uh, of this process, we did two exchanges, one in Nicaragua where the Mexican group came down and one in Mexico where the Nicaraguan group came to Mexico. And these were filled with field visits, um, different activities around learning together. And it was probably one of the richest experiences that everybody had. Um, unfortunately, it's really hard to get farmers to travel. Everybody now seems to request a visa. We weren't able to bring Nicaraguan farmers to Mexico or maybe one or two, but not many. So we had mostly the cooperative but it, but this type of learning, and I was talking today with Rachel about, you know, these were coffee farmers from different countries, so it makes sense. But I've been hearing more and more about how interesting it might be to get farmers from different countries and different areas to talk about climate change, because it is something that they are all facing in their different contexts. So this... You know, farmer to farmer exchange is nothing new. There's Campesino, Campesino in Latin America for a long time. There's a, uh, farmers in Iowa. People do it all the time. But maybe expanding and strengthening this to learn together is, is an opportunity that we have to do this work. You can see more photos um, of people sharing about the power process in this diagram here is the Nicaraguans describing their par process. This is a photo. We went and spent a couple of nights in, in a community, and the community had laid out all their food and fruit, and the Nicaraguans have brought pictures to show the farmers, which was really important to us because food security and food sovereignty was something that we were really interested in working in. The cooperatives, are a little reluctant to engage in this because they are in the business of selling coffee. And sometimes they see these other activities as taking farmers away from producing good coffee, which is what they sell. But just a lot of learning going on. Um, one action outcome I think that we were really happy with is that the cooperative adopted diversification as part of its strategic plan. 
Um, I don't think we pushed for that, right? They did it on their own. Um, so it, it seemed like from the cooperative's perspective, the research had been fruitful and useful and um, invaluable enough to incorporate it into their future planning. Um, this is something that Yannicka work a lot and it is the result of many workshops with farming communities to create a calendar that show the activities of the three main diversity activities. So if they had coffee and, and they didn't have corn or honey, they could see when they were gonna have to work a lot for each one of those crops. And it was something that they asked for. And then also another thing that came from listening and working with, with the farmers was I'm used to always saying, oh, yeah, we're going to do this work and then we're going to do a manual and give it to the farmers. And guess what? The manuals kind of stay on top of a bookshelf somewhere and gather dust. Nobody reads them. But these were made into these posters that could actually be put on people's walls so that they could look at them. And that is, again, something that they talked about. And it really does help someone make a decision. If I'm a coffee farmer, and maybe I'm growing some corn, but I've never gotten into honey, is to be able to look at the activities that it would require for me to keep some beehives and make a, and, and decide if they're coming at a time when I'm already too busy. And maybe all I have is my family to support me with the work. So maybe it's not the best choice because everything stacks at one point. So that was the main um, objective of this is to provide farmers that information across the year. <clears throat> and then because we kept pushing the food part, there were these um, celebrations of the milpa. The milpa is a corn system that is diversified, can have beans and squash and other crops. And it's still the traditional way that people grow corn in these communities. And our proposal has always been, and it has been supported by other research that farmers that grow some of their food, coffee farmers that grow some of their food, usually do better in terms of food security. Some of our earlier research in Central America and also here in this area showed that most of these smallholder coffee farmers go through periods of seasonal food insecurity between July and September because the money from the coffee they sold runs out. The corn that they had stored runs out. They have just planted the next crop of corn and they don't have a lot of money. So they report having a hard time meeting their food needs for the, for the family. And those that grow their own corn, or at least part of it, tend to report lower months of food insecurity over the year. So this is something we were really pushing. They told Rachel's group, I don't like to just come up here and talk, so I'm going to open it up for questions pretty soon. But going back to what I had mentioned, one of the things we've thought about, about the Institute that seems really important at this time is this interaction between the local and the global. In Vermont, as an immigrant, I've always felt that some Vermonters are a little, how could I say it, maybe um, overconfident about how well the food system is going on in Vermont. And I always say, oh, maybe you could learn something from the people that we work with in South America. And so this notion of connecting the global to the local, to learn, to co-learn, to integrate, to transform is something that we, re we really take to heart at the Institute. A lot of our work is international um, and we do have some work in Vermont and lately, um, an extension agent who's also a PhD student in our group has been talking about irrigation and how she thinks that maybe looking at some irrigation for small scale farmers in other countries might be a really good source of knowledge for Vermont small scale vegetable farmers that she works with. So this is something, it's a seed to plant here too. Um, I was talking with Sarah, one of Rachel's students, about that, that I think there's something about 
there are more common problems across the world maybe than we had 20 years ago. Or maybe they've always been there and we haven't really um, exchanged this knowledge, but something to think about for the future. So I'm gonna leave it there and open it up for questions. So thank you very much. So if you've been here before, you know that sometimes Linda Silk comes up to do uh, handle the conversation via the chat. Uh, Linda's off uh, working on transdisciplinary things uh, today in the Southwest, so she's not here. But we have people watching the chat, and I'm happy to take any questions from anybody, uh, so don't be shy. Or comments. Oh, yeah, just discussion. <laughs> Anything's fine. So can I, can I go first? Sure. Um, there are lots of really fascinating, important things for me personally, listening to you. Um, I think the place I'd like to hear a little bit of either what you've learned or what you've crashed into is about humility. And I, I think I don't just mean like the individual humility of a, say a researcher or someone, but also kind of institutional humility. Um, things uh, easy to navigate, uh, complicated, any lessons you want to share with me? Uh, <laughs> Yeah. So we have a paper in, from 2017 where we propose a series of principles for participatory action research, and one of them is humility. And I will say that in part processes, it hasn't been that hard for individuals, as you say. I think it's very challenging institutionally, especially in higher ed in the United States right now. Um, and I have had several leadership positions. I was <laughs> department chair and I was leading this group and now I'm the faculty director. And personally, what I feel that is expected from me is more to be aggressive and <laughs> overconfident and we're going to solve this thing and UVM is going to do it. <laughs> um, so I, I personally believe that we need to push back on that and try to bring this to our leadership work and say it. And I, I, don't, I don't think anybody's laughed at me yet, but I do think people get surprised because we have this notion of leadership and it seems that the higher you go in the hierarchy, the stronger it gets. So not easy to navigate institutionally. I think easier more as individuals. And, um, and also to remind everyone that this is an issue. We're all people, right? And it hap you, you find very humble people in farming communities. There's also arrogant people in farming communities or in cooperatives or nonprofits. So it is an issue everywhere that I think having an awareness of it really helps to try to steer it. But by bringing, by saying that the Institute wants to really focus on PAR and one of the principles of PAR is humility, we are sort of like making an institutional statement of sorts. So we're, yeah, we're trying to push wherever we can. I had a question about agricultural diversity, uh, just the diversifying the agricultural systems in Vermont. I know maple syrup is like a really huge industry mm -hmm. um, there, but climate change, I know, is having a large effect on that. So how are farmers responding to that? And what like goals are they achieving to try to diversify their food systems, especially in forested areas? You know, I haven't heard a lot of the, we, we also have a maple producer in our group. She's actually one of the co-directors of the Institute. Her family is a big maple producer. I've heard a, a, a lot of complaints about how hard it's getting to find that window that the syrup requires. So there's a struggle, but I haven't heard yet that there's a, there's a felt need to diversify 
Um, there is a brand new project right now in Vermont with maple syrup producers exploring that from the, so it's been the year of institutes for the University of Vermont. There's also a new food systems research center and they just funded several projects and one of them is focusing on maple syrup, but I don't work directly with maple syrup producers. So that's all I can tell you. Good question though. Yeah, I, um, <clears throat> for about the past 30 years, I've worked with a group here in the Bangor area, which has a sister city project in, in Karaske, Charles and Angle province, Salvador. Oh, well. And um, I, I think one of the things that I've learned from that group and from those delegations that have gone back and forth is that our ways of processing, even in community, are very, very different. So folks would go down to Karaske and They'd have day long meetings and a lot of process time to come to a decision. Whereas, even in our sort of little group, we would be more like we do at the university. Let's have a two hour meeting, have our agenda, boom, 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 and make some decisions. How have you kind of encountered that? And how do you respond to that sort of you know, cultural mode of thinking about stuff? I think the only way you can respond is by. <coughs> being open and adapting and we i i work when i i spent four years in costa rica and worked with indigenous communities in panama and um in southern costa rica and they when there was a big decision it was a day-long assembly and we work with the panamanian and forest ministry of forestry and i just remember that Forrester being so impatient, but even him, and we were cu more curious about it, and but we couldn't be a part of it. It was closed doors, and and I was just starting to do this kind of work, so I didn't, I was just waiting there. It's like, I don't know what's going on, but, but I think that we need to intentionally just incorporate those cultural practices into the process and respect them. And, and it's, it's not easy. A lot of indigenous communities do that. They, when there's a big decision, they take their time. The, we have a, an Ecuadorian couple in our group and they work with Quechua people. And they were just saying like, sometimes it's like days, like they'll spend the whole day, come out and it's like, we didn't make a decision. We'll go back tomorrow. Um, I think it was them who said that, but that's, that's this piece of, Instead of saying, this is so annoying, being humble and respectful and saying, this is the way they do it. And even maybe having, giving it a chance that maybe it's a better way to make decisions. Um, even though I get impatient too, right? Like, but I do think that that's the, so we need to teach more of this humility in the classroom and saying, it's not about getting stuff done and publishing your paper, but also about connecting and, and learning yeah. a little more deep, deep deeper. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'd say in our group, we, we tried to adopt, you know, maybe we should be doing things here more like that than to slow down a little bit. I'd like to hear more about it. I worked in Chalatenango for a few years. Yeah. Um, sir, can I do one before you and then come to you, Sarah, next? And go ahead, but Ernesto, it sounds like it'll be helpful to, for you to repeat the question once you hear it. Okay. Oh, for the Zoom, yes. So, um, I was wondering, when you first started out, what was your outlook on everything? And how has it evolved um, throughout the years? Because it seems like you've been doing this for a very long time. And with Jenner, like, within the years, a lot has changed. And the question is, how has my outlook changed over all these years that I've been doing this? And given the changing context of the world, we do have some white hair, so. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> so my outlook has changed quite a bit. And, and the reason is I started thinking that I went into agronomy because I wanted to do rural development. And I was, I had left El Salvador and was starting college here in the United States. And I wanted to go back. And I thought, 
the best way for me to support farmers was to help them do an agriculture that was more ecologically sound, like more environmentally friendly, and away from intensive pesticide use and fertilizer use. What I started to learn, and I shared this with the group today, is um, best exemplified by, by an experience, which was when I was working with coffee farmers in El Salvador for my dissertation, I was really interested in the ecology and there's a lot of management of shade trees. So we were having a meeting about pruning shade in the coffee plantation. And all the farmers could talk about was the coffee price, right? And it was just a realization of as much as this stuff that I'm really interested in, it's also important to them, but there's also these other forces that are external to the farm and to the household that are really pushing these farmers to the edge. That was one realization that, that the social economic, the value chain of coffee, the fact that coffee is a commodity were also really important. And incorporating that to our work later on and engaging with some of the actors in the coffee chain. So. It's been moments like that. And so that made me work more on social issues and maybe economic issues. And then realizing that that equity piece keeps leave, continuing to be left out of some of our conversations and projects because it's complicated. Sort of like, again, led me to think, well, if we really wanna make change, if we really wanna support people in the food system, we have to incorporate these things as much as we can. So I think that's how, you know, basically being from a natural scientist to becoming more transdisciplinary and also action oriented. So not research just for research sake, but doing research that can really contribute to improve the situation somewhere. Yeah, that's something I've noticed a lot with taking all the courses that how much, like, there's so many different aspects of each element that needs to be complicated for things to work like there's so much social and economics input on everything everyone does there's also that environmental and like personal in input and it's it's so fast okay, we have three questions on the from the zoom audience right now and they're all good but i'll start with one this is from shauna and i'll just read directly can you talk more about how weaving agroecology into the conversation around transitioning to sustainable agriculture relative to other philosophies and approaches that are being ramped up, i.e. regenerative? So like a wording, different philosophies. Although that one's in the chat. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Yes, that's from the chat. <laughs> that's not my, that's Shauna's question. Protecting my voice here. Um, yeah, that's a great question. So. I really dislike dogma. So it's not like for me, it's agroecology or else. Um, if someone is doing great work and they wanna call it regenerative ag, I'll be the first one to say great work. So personally, right? When you look at how these different approaches and terminologies express themselves in academic and other agricultural sectors, the biggest difference between regenerative ag and agroecology is less about the ecological side of things, but more that increasingly so agroecology has pushed us to look at political economic structures. Whereas I would say that regenerative is still staying more in a biophysical perspective. And not surprisingly, you will find regenerative ag in on the websites of several agro industrial companies that are not well known for their social or environmental contributions. So that piece of saying there's a structural problem here about what kind of farming governments and international institutions were supporting for a really long time and maybe right now they're shifting and those structures are important to make societal change for agriculture and food. I think agroecologists have tried to engage with that 
Some of them are very radical. There's a new paper out there critiquing some of that. But I think it's an important engagement to have. And I would say that that's probably the biggest difference that I see in agriculture now. When I first started, when agriculture was defined as applying ecological principles to agricultural systems, it was a lot more similar to what regenerative is doing now. But there's been an evolution in what the field, and again, these are aspirational, right? Just to be honest and, and, and humble. It's not that it's happening, but so, yeah, I'll leave it there. You want to take one yeah. more, more days? Yeah, and then we'll come up. One more, Sarah, and then we'll. Um, so, question from Maya. How do you think the concept of food justice fits into the transformation of food systems? And what steps can be taken to ensure fair access to nutritious food for all? Yeah, I think that's for us we're, is where we incorporate the equity piece. And in, in the May meeting, we had some food justice activists saying, you know, agroecology needs to engage more with us and also with environmental justice activists. But I think they're actually very aligned. And I think food justice is a very important part of that food transformation. Because again, if we don't ensure that there is a right to food, like a human right to food, if we don't start steering ourselves in that direction, there's always going to be inequality that always comes back with bigger problems. I really believe, I think there's enough evidence out there to show us that. And some interests don't want to engage with that. Some people don't have the knowledge to engage with that. But you know, if we can start to try to move as a collective at the university is a great place to start having, having these conversations. That's why I'm here. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. Fascinating. Um, I see you work with indigenous people, and um, I would like to know um, how you were able to, you know, address issues whereby you give an advice to them, and it's more culture, like it's an advice that that um, that kind of goes against their cultural belief. Maybe in terms of uh, planting two crops together, and it's something like, oh, we don't do that here. Mm -hmm. How are you able to address that issue and if, if that ever came up? So the question is, when working with people that might be from a different culture, how do they, how do I address with the fact that maybe what I'm advising goes against the cult cultural norms or, uh, yeah, or ways of doing things? Yeah, that's that's a tough challenge. And I think if you use participatory action research, the idea is that you're going to develop a trusting relationship with your partners so that you can actually have a conversation. That becomes really hard when there is a power differential. So for example, if a, farm, if a farmer is seeing that I'm funding something that they're doing, doesn't really want to do it, but is scared that I'm going to take away the funding if they don't do it, that power differential just leads to dishonesty and people not telling the truth to each other. So the work is how do you develop these relationships so you can actually have a, a true, honest conversation where maybe I'm going to say, okay, you're right. This recommendation that I'm trying to, that I'm telling you to do doesn't quite fit for X, Y reasons, but also the other way around that I'm given an opportunity to make my case and people are listening truthfully and, and might say the same thing. But I don't believe in forcing people to do anything. I think that's a really bad practice or, or coercing indirectly like, oh, you know, everybody knows that if you don't do this, you're not gonna get the seed they promise you, which is how a lot of things happen, right? So trying to avoid those situations and respecting what people want to do. Um, somebody asked me at one point, if you, 
what if a farmer group comes to you and says, we really want, want you to help us farm conventionally um, using a lot of pesticides and fertilizers? And my answer is, I would say I'm not the best person to support you. Maybe you can find somebody else. Like it, it <coughs> goes both ways, right? Like the honesty. But the, the horizontality of the relationship is really important for the, that. So um, what I've heard from a lot of uh, like academics, um, graduate students, people with faculty positions, is that there's a lot of uh, position, uh, sorry, pressure to publish frequently, um, either to have access to grants or to get tenure or what have you. Um, with the idea of participatory action that you're discussing, it seems like it kind of mandates a longer timeline. You have to invest in building these relationships, um, you know, making sure that people's voices are heard, having those long discussions about making decisions. How do you balance those kind of seemingly conflicting um, elements there? Is that something you've run into? Yes. So the question is, how do you do par in an academic system that uh, rewards a lot of publications and a lot of grants and that our processes take longer and then you might not be able to get all these things out and it's great because a lot of these questions were asked in the group so i feel very ready for them but um so one thing is for people like me i'm a tenured professor to push the system a little bit and we we have done that at, University of Vermont, we used to have a network for community-based research, and we were supporting junior faculty that were trying to engage in that, but also talking to the provost and making a case. Honestly, I don't know how far that went, but we tried. And then there's the faculty member needs to make a choice. You can go in different ways, and I've seen people be successful and fail in either of these directions. One is to figure out what is it that the system wants you to do that might not be par and do it and all do the par too, but do both, which is more work. Um, that's what I chose to do. And I'm in a plant and soil science department, right? Very agronomy focused. So I knew that they were gonna be interested in ecological, biophysical, agronomic publications. So I had these par processes going on. During that time, I was um, giving priority to what I knew was gonna be asked of me, but I kept the process going and it worked. So the what, didn't come out of that is that I wasn't able to publish about the PAR process as much as I could have, which would have helped other people who wanted to do PAR. But, you know, I did that later. Um, some people choose to fight and to say, you know, to go to their chair and dean and say, you know, this is the kind of research I do and you need to give me more credit that I haven't seen that be very successful, honestly. Um, the rules would need to change. I always hear the tenure board say that they're open, but they don't seem to change that much. Um, but I think that what I would say is that there's a lot of power in collaboration. So if you wanna do this work, and you want to be an academic in the tenure track, I think you're best served by developing some strong collaborations so that you're with a group of faculty that are supporting each other and navigating the system together so that I wasn't really collaborating that much when I was going on tenure track in a way that would help me. So I could only do those more agronomic ones but if I would have had closer collaborations, maybe we could have done some of the far stuff too. 
and and I always also prioritize the action items that the cooperatives wanted. So that so that's all I could do, right? And you have to be compassionate with yourself. And there's a limit; <laughs> you you can't do it all. But I think that the institutional change that David brought up is really important. That we need to keep pushing. If we if we think that this is important, and I do, we continue to to push and. I will say that the upper administration did not object to us having participatory action research as one of our guiding pillars. And that means something. And it's just a, a level of acceptance for these approaches is, is growing. Sarah, I know you have another question, but I can share should... it with him after. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that, um, I did say that at the beginning. I didn't do my normal. Thing, out but, of time. Uh, happy for if there's other stuff in the chat or other stuff in the room that you want to bring up, we can help with all those connections. Um, technically, we should stop at four just to let people get to where they need to go. So I, I want to say I've been to a zillion conversations uh, after these talks. This one's just been fantastic coming from all of you and the Zoom audience and you, Ernesto. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.